Chapter 8 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 4, Part 2, Urban Grandier by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by George Burnham Ives. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 The exposure of the plot was most prejudicial to the prosperity of the Ursuline community. Spurious possession, far from bringing to their convent an increase of subscriptions and enhancing their reputation as Mignon had promised, had ended for them in open shame, while in private they suffered from straitened circumstances. For the parents of their boarders hastened to withdraw their daughters from the convent, and the nuns, in losing their pupils, lost their sole source of income. Their fall in the estimation of the public filled them with despair, and it leaked out that they had had several altercations with their director, during which they reproached him for having, by making them commit such a great sin, overwhelmed them with infamy, and reduced them to misery instead of securing for them the great spiritual and temporal advantages he had promised them. Mignon, although devoured by hate, was obliged to remain quiet, but he was none the less as determined as ever to have revenge, and as he was one of those men who never give up while a gleam of hope remains, and whom no waiting can tire, he bided his time, avoiding notice, apparently resigned to circumstances, but keeping his eyes fixed on Grandier, ready to seize on the first chance of recovering possession of the prey that had escaped his hands, and unluckily the chance soon presented itself. It was now 1633. Richelieu was at the height of his power, carrying out his work of destruction, making castles fall before him where he could not make heads fall, in the spirit of John Knox's words, destroy the nests and the crows will disappear. Now one of these nests was the accrenolated castle of Laudon, and Richelieu had therefore ordered its demolition. The person appointed to carry out this order was a man such as those whom Louis XI had employed fifty years earlier to destroy the feudal system, and Robespierre one hundred and fifty years later to destroy the aristocracy. Every woodman needs an axe, every reaper a sickle, and Richelieu found the instrument he required in de Laubardemont, councillor of state. But he was an instrument full of intelligence, detected by the manner in which he was wielded, the moving passion of the wielder and adapting his whole nature with marvellous dexterity to gratify that passion according to the character of him whom it possessed. Now by a rough and ready impetuosity, now by a deliberate and hidden advance, equally willing to strike with the sword or to poison by calumny, as the man who moved him lusted for the blood or sought to accomplish the dishonour of his victim. Monsieur de la Bardemont arrived at Laudon during the month of August 1633, and in order to carry out his mission addressed himself to Sir Mimon de Silly, prefect of the town, that old friend of the cardinals whom Mignon and Bada, as we have said, had impressed so favorably. The man saw in the arrival of Laubardemont a special intimation that it was the will of heaven that the seemingly lost cause of those in whom he took such a warm interest should ultimately triumph. He presented Mignon and all his friends to Monsieur Laubardemont, who received them with much cordiality, they talked of the mother superior, who was a relation, as we have seen, of Monsieur de la Bardemont, and exaggerated the insult offered her by the decree of the archbishop, saying it was an affront to the whole family, and before long, the one thing alone which occupied the thoughts of the conspirators and the counsellor was how best to draw upon Grandier the anger of the cardinal duke. A way soon opened. The queen mother, Marie de Medici, had among her attendants a woman called Hamon, to whom— Having once had occasion to speak, she had taken a fancy and given a post near her person. In consequence of this whim, Hamon came to be regarded as a person of some importance in the queen's household. Hamon was a native of Laudon, and had passed the greater part of her youth there with her own people, who belonged to the lower classes. Grandier had been her confessor, and she attended his church, and as she was lively and clever he enjoyed talking to her, so that at length an intimacy sprang up between them. It so happened at a time when he and the other ministers were in momentary disgrace that a satire full of biting wit and raillery appeared, directed especially against the cardinal, and this satire had been attributed to Hamon, who was known to share, as was natural, her mistress's hatred of Richelieu. Protected as she was by the queen's favor, the cardinal had found it impossible to punish Hamon, but he still cherished a deep resentment against her. It now occurred to the conspirators to accuse Grandier of being the real author of the satire, and it was asserted that he had learned from Hamon all the details of the cardinal's private life, the knowledge of which gave so much point to the attack on him. If they could once succeed in making Richelieu believe this, Grandier was lost. This plan being decided on, Monsieur de Lombardemont was asked to visit the convent, and the devils, knowing what an important personage he was, flocked thither to give him a worthy welcome. 
Accordingly, the nuns had attacks of the most indescribably violent convulsions, and M. de Laubardemont returned to Paris convinced as to the reality of their possession. The first word the Councillor of State said to the Cardinal about Urbain Grandier showed him that he had taken useless trouble in inventing the story about the satire, for by the bare mention of his name he was able to arouse the Cardinal's anger to any height he wished. The fact was that, when Richelieu had been prior of Cousset, he and Grandier had had a quarrel on a question of etiquette, the latter as priest of Laudon having claimed precedence over the prior, and carried his point. The cardinal had noted the affront in his blood-stained tablets, and at the first hint de la Bardemont found him as eager to bring about Grandier's ruin as was the councillor himself. De la Bardemont was at once granted the following commission. Sir de la Bardemont, councillor of state and privy councillor, will betake himself to Laudon and to whatever other places may be necessary, to institute proceedings against Grandier on all the charges formerly preferred against him, and on other facts which have since come to light, touching the possession by evil spirits of the Ursuline nuns of Laudon, and of other persons, who are said likewise to be tormented of devils through the evil practices of the said Grandier. He will diligently investigate everything from the beginning that has any bearing either on the said possession or on the exorcisms, and will forward to us his report thereon, and the reports and other documents sent in by former commissioners and delegates, and will be present at all future exorcisms and take proper steps to obtain evidence of the said facts, that they may be clearly established and, above all, will direct, institute, and carry through the said proceedings against Grandier and all others who have been involved with him in the said case, until definitive sentence be passed, and in spite of any appeal or countercharge, this cause will not be delayed, but without prejudice to the right of appeal in other causes, on account of the nature of the crimes, and no regard will be paid to any request for postponement made by the said Grandier. His Majesty commands all governors, provincial lieutenant generals, bailiffs, seneschals, and other municipal authorities, and all subjects whom it may concern, to give every assistance in arresting and imprisoning all persons whom it may be necessary to put under constraint, if they shall be required so to do. Furnished with this order, which was equivalent to a condemnation, de la Bardemont arrived at Laudon, the 5th of December, 1633, at nine o'clock in the evening, and to avoid being seen he alighted in a suburb at the house of one Maitre Paul Aubin, king's usher and son-in-law of Memin de Silly. His arrival was kept so secret that neither Grandier nor his friends knew of it, but Memin, her Menau, and Mignon were notified and immediately called on him. De la Bardemont received them commission in hand, but broad as it was, it did not seem to them sufficient, for it contained no order for Grandier's arrest, and Grandier might fly. De la Bardemont, smiling at the idea that he could be so much in fault, drew from his pocket an order in duplicate, in case one copy should be lost, dated like the commission, November 30th, signed Louis, and countersigned Philippeau. It was conceived in all the following terms. Louis, etc., etc., we have entrusted these presents to Sir de la Bardemont, privy councillor, to empower the said Sir de la Bardemont to arrest Grandier and his accomplices and imprison them in a secure place, with orders to all provost, marshals, and other officers, and to all our subjects in general to lend whatever assistance is necessary to carry out above order, and they are commanded by these presents to obey all orders given by the said Sieur and all governors and lieutenants general are also hereby commanded to furnish the said sieur with whatever he aid he may require at their hands this document being the completion of the other it was immediately resolved in order to show that they had the royal authority at their back and as a preventative measure to arrest grandier at once without any preliminary investigation they hoped by this step to intimidate any official who might still be inclined to take Grandier's part, and any witness who might be disposed to testify in his favour. Accordingly, they immediately sent for Guillaume Aubin, Sieur de Lagrange, and Provost Lieutenant. De la Bonnemont communicated to him the commission of the cardinal and the order of the king, and requested him to arrest Grandier early next morning. M. de Lagrange could not deny the two signatures, and answered that he would obey but as he foresaw from their manner of going to work that the proceedings about to be instituted would be an assassination and not a fair trial he sent in spite of being a distant connection of a man whose daughter was married to his lagrange's brother to warn grandier of the orders he had received but grandier with his usual intrepidity while thanking lagrange for his generous message sent back word that secure in his innocence and relying on the justice of god he was determined to stand his ground 
So Grandier remained, and his brother, who slept beside him, declared that his sleep that night was as quiet as usual. The next morning he rose, as was his habit, at six o'clock, took his breviary in his hand, and went out with the intention of attending matins at the Church of St. Croix. He had hardly put his foot over the threshold before Lagrange, in the presence of Mamin, Mignon, and of the other conspirators, who had come out to gloat over the sight, arrested him in the name of the king. He was at once placed in the custody of Jean Pouget, an archer in his majesty's guard, and of the archers of the provosts of Laudon and Chinon, to be taken to the castle at Angers. Meanwhile, a search was instituted, and the royal seal affixed to the doors of his apartments, to his presses, his other articles of furniture, in fact, to everything and place in that house, but nothing was found that tended to compromise him, except an essay against the celibacy of priests, and two sheets of paper whereon were written in another hand than his some love poems in the taste of that time. End of chapter 8 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 9 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 4, Part 2, Urbain Grandier by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 For four months Grandier languished in prison, and according to the report of Michelon, commandant of Angers, and of Pierre Bachet, his confessor, he was during the whole period a model of patience and firmness passing his days in reading good books or in writing prayers and meditations, which were afterwards produced at his trial. Meanwhile, in spite of the urgent appeals of Jeanne Estaille, mother of the accused, who, although seventy years of age, seemed to recover her youthful strength and activity in the desire to save her son, La Bardemont continued the examination, which was finished on April 4th. Urbain was then brought back from Angers de Laudon. An extraordinary cell had been prepared for him in a house belonging to Mignon, and which had formerly been occupied by a sergeant named Bontem, once clerk to Trinquant, who had been a witness for the prosecution in the first trial. It was on the topmost story. The windows had been walled up, leaving only one small slit open, and even this opening was secured by enormous iron bars, and by an exaggeration of caution the mouth of the fireplace was furnished with a grating, lest the devil should arrive through the chimney to free the sorcerer from his chains. Furthermore, two holes in the corners of the room, so formed that they were unnoticeable from within, allowed a constant watch to be kept over Grandier's movements by Bontem's wife, a precaution by which they hoped to learn something that would help them in the coming exorcisms. In this room, lying on a little straw and almost without light, Grandier wrote the following letter to his mother. My mother. I received your letter and everything you sent me except the wool and stockings. I endure any affliction with patience, and feel more pity for you than for myself. I am very much inconvenienced for want of a bed. Try and have mine brought to me, for my mind will give way if my body has no rest. If you can, send me a breviary, a Bible, and a St. Thomas for my consolation, and above all, do not grieve for me. I trust that God will bring my innocence to light. Commend me to my brother and sister, and all our good friends. I am, mother, your dutiful son and servant, Grandier. While Grandier had been in prison at Angers, the case of possession at the convent had miraculously multiplied, for it was no longer only the superior and sister Claire who had fallen a prey to the evil spirits, but also several other sisters who were divided into three groups as follows, and separated. The superior, with sisters Louise de Ange, and Anne de St. Agnes were sent to the house of Sieur de la Ville, advocate, legal adviser to the sisterhood. Sisters Claire and Catherine de la Presentation were placed in the house of Canon Morat. Sisters Elisabeth de la Croix, Monique de St. Marte, Jean de St. Esprit, and Seraphique Archer were in a third house. A general supervision was undertaken by Maman's sister, the wife of Mousson, who was thus closely connected with two of the greatest enemies of the accused, and to her Bontem's wife told all that the superior needed to know about Grandier. Such was the manner of the sequestration. The choice of physicians was no less extraordinary. Instead of calling in the most skilled practitioners of Angers, Tours, Poitiers, or Saumur, all of them except Daniel Roger of Laudon, came from the surrounding villages and were men of no education. One of them, indeed, had failed to obtain either degree or license, and had been obliged to leave Saumur in consequence. Another had been employed in a small shop to take goods home, a position he had exchanged for the more lucrative one of quack. 
there was just as little sense of fairness and propriety shown in the choice of the apothecary and surgeon. The apothecary, whose name was Adam, was Mignon's first cousin, and had been one of the witnesses for the prosecution at Grandier's first trial, and as on that occasion he had libelled a young girl of Laudon, he had been sentenced by a decree of Parliament to make a public apology. And yet, though his hatred for Grandier, in consequence of this humiliation, was so well known, perhaps for that very reason, it was to him the duty of dispensing and administering the prescriptions was entrusted, no one supervising the work even so far as to see that the proper doses were given, or taking note whether for sedatives he did not sometimes substitute stimulating and exciting drugs, capable of producing real convulsions. The surgeon, Manori, was still more unsuitable, for he was a nephew of Maman de Silly, and a brother of the nun who had offered the most determined opposition to Grandier's demand for a sequestration of the possessed sisters, during the second series of exorcisms. In vain did the mother and brother of the accused present petitions setting forth the incapacity of the doctors and the hatred of Grandier professed by the apothecary. They could not, even at their own expense, obtain certified copies of any of these petitions. Although they had witnesses ready to prove that Adam had once in his ignorance dispensed crocus metallorum for crocus mantis, a mistake which had caused the death of the patient for whom the prescription was made up. In short, so determined were the conspirators that this time Grandier should be done to death, that they had not even the decency to conceal the infamous methods by which they had arranged to attain this result. The examination was carried on with vigor. As one of the first formalities would be the identification of the accused, Grandier published a memorial in which he recalled the case of St. Anastasius at the Council of Tyre, who had been accused of immorality by a fallen woman whom he had never seen before. When this woman entered the Hall of Justice in order to swear to her deposition, a priest named Timothy went up to her and began to talk to her as if he were Anastasius. Falling into the trap, she answered as if she recognized him, and thus the innocence of the saint was shown forth. Grandier therefore demanded that two or three persons of his own height and complexion should be dressed exactly like himself, and with him should be allowed to confront the nuns. As he had never seen any of them, and was almost certain they had never seen him, they would not be able, he felt sure, to point him out with certainty, in spite of the allegations of undue intimacy with themselves they brought against him. This demand showed such conscious innocence that it was embarrassing to answer, so no notice was taken of it. Meanwhile, the Bishop of Poitiers, who felt much elated at getting the better of the Archbishop of Bordeaux, who of course was powerless against an order issued by the Cardinal Duke, took exception to Père Lascaille and Père Gau, the exorcists appointed by his superior, and named instead his own chaplain, who had been judge at Grandier's first trial and had passed sentence on him, and Père Lactance, a Franciscan monk. These two, making no secret of the side which they sympathized, put up on their arrival at Nicolas Mossens, one of the Grandier's most bitter enemies, on the following day they went to the superior's apartments and began their exorcisms. The first time the superior opened her lips to reply, Père Lactance perceived that she knew almost no Latin, and consequently would not shine during the exorcism. So he ordered her to answer in French, although he still continued to exorcise her in Latin, and when someone was bold enough to object, saying that the devil according to the ritual knew all languages living and dead, and ought to reply in the same language in which he was addressed, the father declared that the incongruity was caused by the pact and that, moreover, some devils were more ignorant than peasants. Following these exorcists and two Carmelite monks named Pierre de Saint Thomas and Pierre de Saint Matarin, who had from the very beginning pushed their way in when anything was going on, came four capuchins sent by Père Joseph, head of the Franciscans, his great eminence as he was called, and whose names were Père Luc, Tranquille, Pote, and Elysée so that a much more rapid advance could be made than hitherto by carrying on the exorcisms in four different places at once, vis-à-vis -vis in the convent and in the churches of Saint-Croix, Saint-Pierre de Martreuil, and Notre-Dame-de-Chateau. Very little of importance took place, however, on the first two occasions, the 15th and 16th of April, for the declarations of the doctors were most vague and indefinite, merely saying that the things they had seen were supernatural, surpassing their knowledge and the rules of medicine. The ceremony of the 23rd April presented, however, some points of interest. The superior, in reply to the interrogations of Père Lactance, stated that the demon had entered her body under the forms of a cat, a dog, a stag, and a buck-goat. Quotis? How often inquired the exorcist? I didn't notice the day, 
replied the superior, mistaking the word quotis for quando or when. It was probably to revenge herself for this error that the superior declared the same day that Grandier had on his body five marks made by the devil, and that though his body was else insensible to pain, he was vulnerable at those spots. Minori, the surgeon, was therefore ordered to verify this assertion, and the day appointed for the verification was the twenty-sixth. In virtue of this mandate, Manori presented himself early on that day at Grandier's prison, caused him to be stripped naked and cleanly shaven, then ordered him to be laid on a table and his eyes bandaged. But the devil was wrong again. Grandier had only two marks instead of five, one on the shoulder blade and the other on the thigh. Then took place one of the most abominable performances that can be imagined. Manori held in his hand a probe with a hollow handle, into which the needle slipped when a spring was touched. When Minori applied the probe to those parts of Grandier's body, which, according to the superior, were insensible, he touched the spring, and the needle, while seemingly to bury itself in the flesh, really retreated into the handle, thus causing no pain. But when he touched one of the marks, said to be vulnerable, he left the needle fixed, and drove it into the depth of several inches. The first time he did this, it drew from poor Grandier, who was taken unprepared, such a piercing cry that it was heard in the street by the crowd which had gathered round the door. From the mark on the shoulder-blade with which he had commenced, Minori passed to that on the thigh. But though he plunged the needle into its full depth, Grandier uttered neither cry nor groan, but went on quietly repeating a prayer, and notwithstanding that Minori stabbed him twice more through each of the two marks, he could draw nothing from his victim but prayers for his tormentors. Monsieur de la Bonnemont was present at this scene. The next day the devil was addressed in such forcible terms that an acknowledgment was wrung from him that Grandier's body bore not five but two marks only, and also, to the vast admiration of the spectators, he was able this time to indicate their precise situation. Unfortunately for the demon, a joke in which he indulged on this occasion detracted from the effect of the above proof of cleverness. Having been asked why he had refused to speak on the preceding Saturday, he said he had not been at Laudon on that day, as the whole morning he had been occupied in accompanying the soul of a certain Le Proust, attorney to the Parliament of Paris to hell. This answer awoke such doubts in the breasts of some of the laymen present that they took the trouble to examine the register of deaths, and found that no one of the name of Le Proust, belonging to any profession whatever, had died on that date. This discovery rendered the devil less terrible, and perhaps less amusing. Meantime, the progress of the other exorcisms met with like interruptions. Père Pierre de Saint Thomas, who had conducted the operations in the Carmelite Church, asked one of the possessed sisters where Grandier's books of magic were. She replied that they were kept at the house of a certain young girl, whose name she gave, and who was the same to whom Adam had been forced to apologize. De Laubardemont, Moussant, Herve, and Minau hastened at once to the house indicated, searched the rooms and the presses, opened the chests and the wardrobes, and all the secret places in the house, but in vain. On their return to the church, they reproached the devil for having deceived them, but he explained that a niece of the young woman had removed the books. Upon this they hurried to the niece's dwelling, but unluckily she was not at home, having spent the whole day at a certain church making her devotions and when they went thither the priests and attendants averred that she had not gone out all day. So, notwithstanding the desire of the exorcist to oblige Adam, they were forced to let the matter drop. These two false statements increased the number of unbelievers, but it was announced that a most interesting performance would take place on May 4th. Indeed, the program, when issued, was varied enough to arouse general curiosity. Asmodeus was to raise the superior two feet from the ground, and the fiends Azas and Cerberus, in emulation of their leader, would do as much for two other nuns, while a fourth devil named Beharet would go farther still, and greatly daring would attack Monsieur de Laubardemont himself, and having spirited his counsellor's cap from his head, would hold it suspended in the air of, for the space of a misere. Furthermore, the exorcists announced that six of the strongest men in the town would try to prevent the contortions of the weakest of the convulsed nuns, and would fail. It need hardly be said that the prospect of such an entertainment filled the church on the appointed day to overflowing. Père Lactance began by calling on Asmodeus to fulfill his promise of raising the superior from the ground. She began hereupon to perform various evolutions on her mattress, and at one moment it seemed as if she were really suspended in the air. But one of the spectators lifted her dress and showed that she was only standing on tiptoe, which 
though it might be clever, was not miraculous. Shouts of laughter rent the air, which had such an intimidating effect on Azos and Cerberus that not all the adjurations of the exorcists could extract the slightest response. Beharit was their last hope, and he replied that he was prepared to lift up Monsieur de Lombardemont's cap, and would do so before the expiration of a quarter of an hour. We must here remark that this time the exorcisms took place in the evening, instead of in the morning as hitherto, and it was now growing dark, and darkness is favorable to illusions. Several of the unbelieving ones present, therefore, began to call attention to the fact that the quarter of an hour's delay would necessitate the employment of artificial light during the next scene. They also noticed that Monsieur de la Baudemont had seated himself apart, and immediately beneath one of the arches in the vaulted roof, through which a hole had been drilled for the passage of the bell-rope. They therefore slipped out of the church and up into the belfry where they hid. In a few moments a man appeared who began to work at something. They sprang on him and seized his wrists, and found, in one of his hands, a thin line of horsehair, to one end of which a hook was attached. The holder, being frightened, dropped the line and fled, and although Monsieur de la Baudemont, the exorcists, and the spectators waited, expecting every moment that the cap would rise into the air, it remained quite firm on the owner's head, to the no small confusion of Père Lactance, who, all unwitting of the fiasco, had continued to abjure Beharet to keep his word of course, without the least effect. Altogether this performance of May 4th went anything but smoothly. Till now no trick had succeeded, never before had the demons been such bunglers. But the exorcists were sure that the last trick would go off without a hitch. This was that a nun held by six men chosen for their strength would succeed in extricating herself from their grasp despite their utmost efforts. Two Carmelites and two Capuchins went through the audience and selected six giants from among the porters and messengers of the town. This time the devil answered expectations by showing that if he was not clever he was strong, for although the six men tried to hold her down upon her mattress, the superior was seized with such terrible convulsions that she escaped from their hands, throwing down one of those who tried to detain her. This experiment, thrice renewed, succeeded thrice, and belief seemed about to return to the assembly when a physician of Samor named Duncan, suspecting trickery, entered the choir, and, ordering the six men to retire, said he was going to try and hold the superior down unaided, and if she escaped from his hands he would make a public apology for his unbelief. Monsieur de la Baudemont tried to prevent this test by objecting to Duncan as an atheist. But as Duncan was greatly respected on account of his skill and probity, there was such an outcry at this interference from the entire audience that the commissioner was forced to let him have his way. The six porters were therefore dismissed, but instead of resuming their places among the spectators, they left the church by the sacristy, while Duncan, approaching the bed on which the superior had again lain down, seized her by the wrist, and making certain that he had a firm hold, he told the exorcist to begin. Never up to that time had it been so clearly shown that the conflict going on was between public opinion and the private aims of a few. A hush fell on the church. Everyone stood motionless in silent expectancy. The moment Père Lactance uttered the sacred words, the convulsions of the superior recommenced, but it seemed as if Duncan had more strength than his six predecessors together. For twist and writhe and struggle as she would, the superior's wrist remained none the less firmly clasped in Duncan's hand. At length she fell back on her bed exhausted, exclaiming, "'It is no use! It's no use! He's holding me!' "'Release her arm!' shouted Père Lactance in a rage. "'How can the convulsions take place if you hold her that way?' "'If she is really possessed by a demon,' answered Duncan aloud, "'he should be stronger than I, for it is stated in the ritual that among the symptoms of possession is strength, beyond one's years, beyond one's condition, and beyond what is natural.' "'That is badly argued,' said Lactant sharply. "'A demon outside the body is indeed stronger than you, but when enclosed in a weak frame such as this it cannot show such strength, for its efforts are proportioned to the strength of the body it possesses.' "'Enough,' said Monsieur de la Bardemont. "'We did not come here to argue with philosophers, but to build up the faith of Christians.' With that he rose up from his chair amidst a terrible uproar, and the assembly dispersed in the utmost disorder, as if they were leaving a theatre rather than a church. The ill success of this exhibition caused a cessation of events of interest for some days. The result was that a great number of noblemen and other people of quality who had come to Laudon expecting to see wonders, and had been shown only commonplace transparent tricks, began to think it was not worth while remaining any longer and went their several ways. 
a defection much bewailed by Père Tranquille in a little work which he published on this affair. Many, he says, came to see miracles at Lauton, but finding the devils did not give them the signs they expected, they went away dissatisfied and swelled the numbers of the unbelieving. It was determined, therefore, in order to keep the town full, to predict some great event which would revive curiosity and increase faith. Père Lactance, therefore, announced that on the 20th of May, three of the seven devils dwelling in the superior would come out, leaving three wounds in her left side, which corresponding holes in her chemise, bodice, and dress. The three parting devils were Asmodeus, Grezel de Tron, and Amand de Puissance. He added that the superior's hands would be bound behind her back at the time the wounds were given. On the appointed day, the church of St. Croix was filled to overflowing with sightseers, curious to know if the devils would keep their promises better this time than the last. Physicians were invited to examine the superior's side and her clothes, and amongst those who came forward was Duncan, whose presence guaranteed the public against deception. But none of the exorcists ventured to exclude him, despite the hatred in which they held him, a hatred which they would have made him feel if he had not been under the special protection of Marshal Brez. The physicians, having completed their examination, gave the following certificate. We have found no wound in the patient's side, no rent in her vestments, and our search revealed no sharp instrument hidden in the folds of her dress. These preliminaries, having been got through, Père Lactance questioned her in French for nearly two hours, her answers being in the same language. Then he passed from questions to adjurations. On this, Duncan came forward and said a promise had been given that the superior's hands should be tied behind her back, in order that there might be no room for suspicion of fraud, and that the moment had now arrived to keep that promise. Père Lactance admitted the justice of the demand, but said, as there were many present who had never seen the superior in convulsions such as afflicted the possessed, it would be only fair that she should be exercised for their satisfaction before binding her. Accordingly, he began to repeat the form of exorcism, and the superior was immediately attacked by frightful convulsions, which in a few minutes produced complete exhaustion, so that she fell on her face to the ground, and, turning on her left arm and side, remained motionless some instants, after which she uttered a low cry, followed by a groan. The physicians approached her, and Duncan, seeing her take away her hand from her left side, seized her arm and found that the tips of her fingers were stained with blood. They then examined her clothing and body, and found her dress, bodice, and chemise cut through in three places, the cuts being less than an inch long. There were also three scratches beneath the left breast, so slight as to be scarcely more than skin deep, the middle one being a barleycorn in length. Still, from all three a sufficient quantity of blood had oozed to stain the chemise above them. This time the fraud was so glaring that even de Larbardemont exhibited some signs of confusion because of the number and quality of the spectators. He would not, however, allow the doctors to include in their report their opinion as to the manner in which the wounds were inflicted, but Grandier protested against this in a statement of facts which he drew up during the night and which was distributed next day. It was as follows. That if the superior had not groaned, the physicians would not have removed her clothes and would have suffered her to be bound without having the least idea that the wounds were already made that then the exorcists would have commanded the devils to come forth leaving the traces they had promised that the superior would then have gone through the most extraordinary contortions of which she was capable and have had a long fit of convulsions at the end of which she would have been delivered from the three demons and the wounds would have been found in her body that her groans which had betrayed her had by god's will thwarted the best laid plans of men's and devils why do you suppose he went on to ask that clean incised wounds such as a sharp blade would make were chosen for a token seeing that the wounds left by devils resemble burns was it not because it was easier for the superior to conceal a lancet with which to wound herself slightly than to conceal any instrument sufficiently heated to burn her why do you think the left side was chosen rather than the forehead and nose if not because she could not give herself a wound in either of those places without being seen by all the spectators why was the left side rather than the right chosen if it were not that it was easier for the superior to wound herself with her right hand which she habitually used in the left side than in the right why did she turn on her left side and arm and remain so long in that position if it were not to hide from the bystanders the instrument with which she wounded herself what do you think caused her to groan in spite of all her resolution if it were not the pain of the wound she gave herself for the most courageous cannot repress a shudder when the surgeon opens a vein. Why were her fingertips stained with blood? 
if it were not that the secreted blade was so small that the fingers which held it could not escape being reddened by the blood it caused to flow how came it that the wounds were so superficial that they barely went deeper than the cuticle while devils are known to rend and tear demoniacs when leaving them if it were not that the superior did not hate herself enough to inflict deep and dangerous wounds despite this logical protest from grandier and the barefaced knavery of the exorcist monsieur de laubardemont prepared a report of the expulsion of the three devils asmodeus grazil and amon from the body of sister jeanne des anges through three wounds below the region of the heart a report which was afterwards shamelessly used against grandier and of which the memorandum still exists a monument not so much of credulity and superstition as of hatred and revenge Père Lactance, in order to allay the suspicions which the pretended miracle had aroused among the eyewitnesses, asked Belam, one of the four demons who still remained in the superior's body the following day, why Asmodeus and his two companions had gone out against their promise, while the superior's face and hands were hidden from the people. "'To lengthen the incredulity of certain people,' answered Belam. As for Père Tranquille, he published a little volume describing the whole affair, in which, with the irresponsible frivolity of a true capuchin, he poked fun at those who could not swallow the miracles wholesome. They had every reason to feel vexed, he said, at the small courtesy or civility shown by the demons to persons of their merit and station, but if they had examined their consciences, perhaps they would have found the real reason of their discontent, and turning their anger against themselves would have done penance for having come to the exorcisms led by a depraved moral sense and a prying spirit. Nothing remarkable happened from the 20th May till the 13th June, a day which became noteworthy by reason of the superiors vomiting a quill a finger long. It was doubtless this last miracle which brought the Bishop of Poitiers to Lauton, not, as he said, to those who came to pay their respects to him, to examine into the genuineness of the possession, but to force those to believe who still doubted, and to discover the classes which Urbain had founded to teach the black art to pupils of both sexes. Thereupon the opinion began to prevail among the people that it would be prudent to believe in the possession, since the king, the cardinal duke, and the bishop believed in it, and that continued doubt would lay them open to the charges of disloyalty to their king and their church, and of complicity in the crimes of Grandier, and thus draw upon them the ruthless punishment of la Bardemont. the reason we feel so certain that our work is pleasing to god is that it is also pleasing to the king wrote pere lactance the arrival of the bishop was followed by a new exorcism and of this an eyewitness who was a good catholic and a firm believer in possession has left us a written description more interesting than any we could give we shall present it to our readers word for word as it stands on Friday, 23rd June, 1634, on the eve of St. John, about 3 p.m., the Lord Bishop of Poitiers and Monsieur de la Bonnemont, being present in the church of St. Croix of Laudon, to continue the exorcisms of the Ursuline nuns, by order of Monsieur de la Bardemont, commissioner, Urbain Grandier, priest in charge, accused and denounced as a magician by the said possessed nuns, was brought from his prison to the said church. They were produced by the said commissioner to the said Urbain Grandier, four packs mentioned several times by the said possessed nuns at the preceding exorcisms, which the devils who possessed the nuns declared they had made with the said Grandier on several occasions. There was one in especial which Leviathan gave up on Saturday the 17th, composed of an infant's heart procured at a witch's Sabbath, held in Orleans in 1631. The ashes of a consecrated wafer, blood, etc., of the said Grandier, whereby Leviathan asserted he had entered the body of the sister, Jeanne des Anges, the superior of the said nuns, and took possession of her with his coadjutors, Beharit, Azas, and Balaam, on December 8, 1632. Another such pact was composed of the pips of Granada oranges, and was given up by Asmodeus and a number of other devils. It had been made to hinder Beharit from keeping his promise to lift the commissioner's hat two inches from his head and to hold it there the length of a miserere, as a sign that he had come out of the nun. On all these packs being shown to the said Grandier, he said without astonishment, but with much firmness and resolution, that he had no knowledge of them whatever, that he had never made them and had not the skill by which to make them, that he had held no communication with devils and knew nothing of what they were talking about. A report of all this being made and shown to him, he signed it. 
This done, they brought all the possessed nuns to the number of eleven or twelve, including three lay sisters, also possessed, into the choir of the said church, accompanied by a great many monks, Carmelites, Capuchins, and Franciscans, and by three physicians and a surgeon. The sisters on entering made some wanton remarks, calling Grandier their master, and exhibiting great delight at seeing him. Thereupon Père Lactance and Gabriel, a Franciscan brother, and one of the exorcists exhorted all present with great fervor to lift up their hearts to God, and to make an act of contrition for the offenses committed against his divine majesty, and to pray that the number of their sins might not be an obstacle to the fulfillment of their plans which he, in his providence, had formed for the promotion of his glory on that occasion, and to give outward proof of their heartfelt grief by repeating the confiteor as a preparation for the blessing of the Lord Bishop of Poitiers. This having been done, he went on to say that the matter in question was of such moment and such important in its relation to the great truths of the Roman Catholic Church, that this consideration alone ought to be sufficient to excite their devotion, and furthermore, that the affliction of these poor sisters was so peculiar and had lasted so long, that charity impelled all those who had the right to work for their deliverance and the expulsion of the devils to employ the power entrusted to them with their office in accomplishing so worthy a task by the forms of exorcism prescribed by the church to its ministers then addressing grandier he said that he having been anointed as a priest belonging to this number and that he ought to help with all his power and with all his energy if the bishop were pleased to allow him to do so and to remit his suspension from authority the bishop having granted permission the franciscan friar offered a stole to grandier who turning toward the prelate asked him if he might take it on receiving a reply in the affirmative he passed it round his neck and on being offered a copy of the ritual he asked permission to accept it as before and received the bishop's blessing prostrating himself at his feet to kiss them whereupon the veni creator spiritus having been sung he rose and addressing the bishop asked my lord who am i to exercise the said bishop having replied these maidens grandier asked again what maidens the possessed maidens was the answer that is to say my lord said he that i am obliged to believe in the fact of possession the church believes in it therefore i too believe but i cannot believe that a sorcerer can cause a christian to be possessed unless the christian consent upon this some of those present exclaimed that it was heretical to profess such a belief that the contrary was indubitable believed by the whole church and approved by the sorbonne to which he replied that his mind on that point was not yet irrevocably made up that what he had said was simply his own idea and that in any case he submitted to the opinion of the whole body of which he was only a member that nobody was declared a heretic for having doubts but only for persisting in them and that what he had advocated was only for the purpose of drawing an assurance from the bishop that in doing what he was about to do he would not be abusing the authority of the church Sister Catherine, having been brought to him by the Franciscan, as the most ignorant of all the nuns, and the least open to the suspicion of being acquainted with Latin, he began the exorcism in the form prescribed by the ritual. But as soon as he began to question her he was interrupted, for all the other nuns were attacked by devils, and uttered strange and terrible noises. Amongst the rest Sister Claire came near, and reproached him for his blindness and obstinacy so that he was forced to leave the nun with whom he had begun and address his words to the said Sister Claire, who during the entire duration of the exorcism continued to talk at random without paying any heed to Grandier's words, which were also interrupted by the Mother Superior, to whom he at last gave attention, leaving Sister Claire. But it is to be noted that before beginning to exorcise the Superior, he said, speaking in Latin as heretofore, that knowing she understood Latin he would question her in Greek to which the devil replied by the mouth of the possessed ah how clever you are you know it was one of the first conditions of our pact that i was not to answer in greek upon this he cried o pulchra illusio egregica evasio o superb fraud outrageous evasion he was then told that he was permitted to exercise in greek provided he first wrote down what he wished to say, and the superior hereupon said that he should be answered in what language he pleased. But it was impossible, for as soon as he opened his mouth, all the nuns recommenced their shrieks and paroxysms, showing unexampled despair and giving way to convulsions, which in each patient assumed a new form, and persisting in accusing Grandier of using magic and the black art to torment them, 
offering to wring his neck if they were allowed and trying to outrage his feelings in every possible way. But this being against the prohibitions of the church, the priests and monks present worked with the utmost zeal to calm the frenzy which had seized on the nuns. Grandier, meanwhile, remained calm and unmoved, gazing fixedly at the maniacs, protesting his innocence and praying to God for protection. Then, addressing himself to the bishop and Monsieur de la Bardemont, he implored them by the ecclesiastical and royal authority, of which they were the ministers to command, these demons to wring his neck, or at least to put a mark on his forehead if he were guilty of the crime of which they accused him, that the glory of God might be shown forth, the authority of the church vindicated, and himself brought to confusion, provided that the nuns did not touch him with their hands. But this the bishop and the commissioner would not consent, because they did not want to be responsible for what might happen to him. Neither would they expose the authority of the church to the wiles of the devils, who might have made some pact on that point with Grandier. Then the exorcists, to the number of eight, having commanded the devils to be silent and to cease their tumult, ordered a brazier to be brought, and into this they threw the packs one by one, whereupon the convulsions returned with such awful violence and confused cries, rising into frenzied shrieks and accompanied by such horrible contortions, that the scene might have been taken for an orgy of witches, were it not for the sanctity of the place and the character of those present, of whom Grandier, and outward seeming at least, was the least amazed of any, although he had the most reason. The devils continued their accusations, citing the places, the days, and the hours of their intercourse with him, the first spell he cast on them, his scandalous behavior, his insensibility, his abjurations of God and the faith. To all this he calmly returned that these accusations were calumnies, and all the more unjust considering his profession, that he renounced Satan and all his fiends, having neither knowledge nor comprehension of them, that in spite of all he was a Christian, and what was more an anointed priest, that though he knew himself to be a sinful man, yet his trust was in God and in his Christ, that he had never indulged in such abominations, and that it would be impossible to furnish any pertinent and convincing proof of his guilt. At this point no words could express what the senses perceived. Eyes and ears received an impression of being surrounded by furies, such has never been gathered together before. And unless accustomed to such ghastly scenes as those who sacrificed the demons, no one could keep his mind free from astonishment and horror in the midst of such a spectacle. Grandier alone remained unchanged through it all, seemingly insensible to the monstrous exhibitions, singing hymns to the Lord with the rest of the people, as confident as if he were guarded by legions of angels. One of the demons cried out that Beelzebub was standing between him and Père Tranquille the Capuchin, upon which Grandier said to the demon, A mutescas, hold thy peace. Upon this the demon began to curse, and said that was their watchword. But they could not hold their peace, because God was infinitely powerful, and the powers of hell could not prevail against him. Thereupon they all struggled to get at Grandier, threatening to tear him limb from limb, to point out his marks, to strangle him although he was their master, whereupon he seized a chance to say he was neither their master nor their servant, and that it was incredible that they should in the same breath acknowledge him for their master and express a desire to strangle him. On hearing this, the frenzy of the nuns reached its height, and they kicked their slippers into his face. "'Just look,' said he, "'the shoes drop from the hooves of their own accord.' At length, had it not been for the help and interposition of people in the choir, the nuns in their frenzy would have taken the life of the chief personage in this, in this spectacle, so there was no choice but to take him away from the church and the furies who threatened his life. He was therefore brought back to prison about six o'clock in the evening, and the rest of the day the exorcists were employed in calming the poor sisters, a task of no small difficulty. Everyone did not regard the possessed sisters with the indulgent eye of the author of the above narrative, and many saw in this terrible exhibition of hysteria and convulsions an infamous and sacrilegious orgy, at which revenge ran riot. There was such difference of opinion about it that it was considered necessary to publish the following proclamation by means of placards on July 2nd. All persons of whatever rank or profession are hereby expressly forbidden to traduce or in any way malign the nuns and other persons at Laudon possessed by evil spirits, or their exorcists, or those who accompany them either to the places appointed for exorcism or elsewhere, in any form or manner whatever, on pain of a fine of ten thousand livres, or a larger sum and corporal punishment should the case so require, 
and in order that no one may plead ignorance hereof, this proclamation will be read and published today from the pulpits of all the churches, and copies affixed to the church doors and in other suitable public places. Done at Laudon, July 2nd, 1634. This order had great influence with worldly folk, and from that moment, whether their belief was strengthened or not, they no longer dared to express any incredulity. But in spite of that, the judges were put to shame, for the nuns themselves began to repent, and on the following day, the impious scene above described, just as Père Lactance began to exercise Sister Claire in the castle chapel, she rose, and turning towards the congregation while tears ran down her cheeks, said in a voice that could be heard by all present that she was going to speak the truth at last in the sight of heaven. Thereupon she confessed that all that she had said during the last fortnight against Grandier was calumnious and false, and that all her actions had been done at the instigation of the Franciscan Père Lactance, the director Mignon, and the Carmelite brothers. Père Lactance, not in the least taken aback, declared that her confession was a fresh wile of the devil to save her master Grandier. She then made an urgent appeal to the bishop and to Monsieur de la Bardemont, asking to be sequestered and placed in charge of other priests than those who had destroyed her soul by making her bear false witness against an innocent man. But they only laughed at the pranks the devil was playing and ordered her to be at once taken back to the house in which she was then living. When she heard this order, she darted out of the choir, trying to escape through the church door, imploring those present to come to her assistance and save her from everlasting damnation. But such terrible fruit had the proclamation borne that no one dared respond. So she was recaptured and taken back to the house in which she was sequestered, never to leave it again. End of chapter 9 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 10 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 4, Part 2, Urbain Grandier by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 The next day a still more extraordinary scene took place. While Monsieur de la Bardemont was questioning one of the nuns, the superior came down into the court, barefooted in her chemise and a cord round her neck, and there she remained for two hours in the midst of a fearful storm, not shrinking before lightning, thunder, or rain, but waiting till Monsieur de la Bardemont and the other exorcists should come out. At length the door opened and the royal commissioner appeared, whereupon Sister Jeanne des Anges, throwing herself at his feet, declared she had not sufficient strength to play the horrible part they had made her learn any longer, and that before God and man she declared Urbain Grandier innocent, saying that all the hatred which she and her companions had felt against him arose from the baffled desires which his comeliness awoke, desires which the seclusion of conventional life made still more ardent. Monsieur de Laubardemont threatened her with the full weight of his displeasure, but she answered, weeping bitterly, that all she now dreaded was her sin, for though the mercy of the Saviour was great, she felt that the crime she had committed could never be pardoned. Monsieur de Laubardemont exclaimed that it was the demon who dwelt in her who was speaking, but she replied that the only demon by whom she had even been possessed was the spirit of vengeance, and that it was indulgence in her own evil thoughts and not a pact with the devil which had admitted him into her heart. With these words she withdrew slowly, still weeping, and going into the garden, attached one end of the cord round her neck to the branch of a tree, and hanged herself. But some of the sisters who had followed her cut her down before her life was extinct. The same day an order for her strict seclusion was issued for her as for Sister Claire, and the circumstances that she was a relation of Monsieur de Laubardemont did not avail to lessen her punishment in view of the gravity of her fault. It was impossible to continue the exorcisms other nuns might be tempted to follow the example of the superior and Sister Claire, and in that case all would be lost. And besides, was not Urbain Grandier well and duly convicted? It was announced, therefore, that the examination had proceeded far enough, and that the judges would consider the evidence and deliver judgment. This long succession of violent and irregular breaches of law procedure, the repeated denials of his claim to justice, the refusal to let his witnesses appear, or to listen to his defense, all combined to convince Grandier that his ruin was determined on, for the case had gone so far, and had attained such publicity, that it was necessary either to punish him as a sorcerer and magician, 
or to render a royal commissioner a bishop an entire community of nuns several monks of various orders many judges of high reputation and laymen of birth and standing liable to the penalties incurred by calumniators but although as this conviction grew he confronted it with resignation his courage did not fail and holding it to be his duty as a man and a christian to defend his life and honor to the end he drew up and published another memorandum headed reasons for acquittal and had copies laid before his judges it was a weighty and impartial summing up of the whole case such as a stranger might have written and began with these words i entreat you in all humility to consider deliberately and with attention what the psalmist says in psalm eighty two where he exhorts judges to fulfill their charge with absolute rectitude they being themselves mere mortals who will one day have to appear before god the sovereign judge of the universe to give an account of their administration the lord's anointed speaks to you to-day who are sitting in judgment and says god standeth in the congregation of the mighty he judgeth among the gods how long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked defend the poor and fatherless do justice to the afflicted and needy deliver the poor and needy rid them out of the hand of the wicked i have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the most high but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes but this appeal although convincing and dignified had no influence upon the commission and on the eighteenth of august the following verdict and sentence was pronounced we have declared and do hereby declare urbain grandier duly accused and convicted of the crimes of magic and witchcraft and of causing the persons of certain ursuline nuns of this town and of other females to become possessed of evil spirits wherefrom other crimes and offences have resulted by way of reparation therefore we have sentenced and do hereby sentence that said grandier to make public apology bareheaded with a cord round his neck holding a lighted torch of two pounds weight in his hand before the west door of the church of st pierre in the market-place and before that of st ursule both of this town and there on bended knee to ask pardon of god and the king and the law and this done to be taken to the public square of st croix and there to be attached to a stake set in the midst of a pile of wood both of which to be prepared there for this purpose and to be burnt alive along with the pacts and spells which remain in the hands of the clerk and the manuscript of the book written by the said grandier against a celibate priesthood and his ashes to be scattered to the four winds of heaven and we have declared and do hereby declare all and every part of his property confiscate to the king to the sum of one hundred and fifty livres being first taken therefrom to be employed in the purchase of a copper plate whereupon the substance of the present decree shall be engraved the same to be exposed in a conspicuous place in the said church of saint ursule there to remain in perpetuity and before this sentence is carried out we order the said grandier to be put to the question ordinary and extraordinary so that his accomplices may become known pronounced at laudon against the said grandier this eighteenth day of august sixteen thirty four on the morning of the day on which this sentence was passed m de laubardemont ordered the surgeon francois fourneau to be arrested at his own house and taken to grandier's cell although he was ready to go there of his own free will in passing through the adjoining room he heard the voice of the accused saying what do you want with me wretched executioner have you come to kill me you know how cruelly you have already tortured my body well i am ready to die on entering the room fourneau saw that these words had been addressed to the surgeon manori one of the officers of the grand prévot de l'hôtel to whom m de la barnemont lent for the occasion the title of officer of the king's guard ordered the new arrival to shave grandier and not leave a single hair on his whole body this was a formality employed in cases of witchcraft so that the devil should have no place to hide in for it was the common belief that if a single hair were left the devil could render the accused insensible to the pains of torture from this urbain understood that the verdict had gone against him and that he was condemned to death fourneau having saluted grandier proceeded to carry out his orders whereupon a judge said it was not sufficient to shave the body of the prisoner but that his nails must also be torn out lest the devil should hide beneath them grandier looked at the speaker with an expression of unutterable pity and held out his hands to fourneau but fourneau put them gently aside and said he would do nothing of the kind even were the order given by the cardinal duke himself 
and at the same time begged Grandier's pardon for shaving him. At these words Grandier, who had for so long met with nothing but barbarous treatment from those with whom he had come in contact, turned toward the surgeon with tears in his eyes, saying, "'So you are the only one who has any pity for me.' "'Ah, sir,' replied Fourneau, "'you don't see everybody.' Grandier was then shaved, but only two marks found on him, one, as we have said, on the shoulder-blade and the other on the thigh. Both marks were very sensitive, the wounds which Manori had made not having yet healed. This point having been certified by Fourneau, Grandier was handed not his own clothes, but some wretched garments which had probably belonged to some other condemned man. Then, although his sentence had been pronounced at the Carmelite convent, he was taken by the grand provost officer with two of his archers, accompanied by the provost of Laudon and Chinon, to the town hall, where several ladies of quality, among them Madame de la Baudemont, led by curiosity, were sitting beside the judges, waiting to hear the sentence read. Monsieur de la Baudemont was in the seat usually occupied by the clerk, and the clerk was standing before him. All the approaches were lined with soldiers. Before the accused was brought in, Père Lactance and another Franciscan who had come with him exercised him to oblige the devils to leave him. Then, entering the judgment hall, they exercised the earth, the air, and the other elements. Not till that was done was Grandier led in. At first he was kept at the far end of the hall to allow time for the exorcisms to have their full effect. Then he was brought forward to the bar and ordered to kneel down. Grandier obeyed, but could remove neither his hat nor his skull-cap as his hands were bound behind his back, whereupon the clerk seized on the one and the provost officer on the other and flung them at de la Baudemont's feet. Seeing that the accused fixed his eyes on the commissioner as if waiting to see what he was about to do, the clerk said, "'Turn your head, unhappy man, and adore the crucifix above the bench.' Grandier obeyed without a murmur and with great humility, and remained sunk in silent prayer for about ten minutes. He then resumed his former attitude." The clerk then began to read the sentence in a trembling voice, while Grandier listened with unshaken firmness and wonderful tranquillity. Although it was the most terrible sentence that could be passed, condemning the accused to be burnt alive the same day after the infliction of ordinary and extraordinary torture. When the clerk had ended, Grandier said, with a voice unmoved from its usual calm, Monseigneurs, I aver in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the Blessed Virgin my only hope that I have never been a magician, that I have never committed sacrilege, that I know no other magic than that of the Holy Scriptures, which I have always preached, and that I have never held any other belief than that of our Holy Mother, the Catholic Apostolic Church of Rome. I renounce the devil and all his works. I confess my Redeemer, and I pray to be saved through the blood of the cross. And I beseech you, messieurs, to mitigate the rigor of my sentence, and not to drive my soul to despair. The concluding words led de la Baudemont to believe that he could obtain some admission from Grandier through fear of suffering. So he ordered the court to be cleared, and being left alone with Maitre Homain, criminal lieutenant of Orléans, and the Franciscans, he addressed Grandier in a stern voice, saying there was only one way to obtain any mitigation of his sentence, and that was to confess the names of his accomplices and assign the confession. Grandier replied that having committed no crime, he could have no accomplices. Whereupon, La Baudemont ordered the prisoner to be taken to the torture chamber, which adjoined the judgment hall, an order which was instantly obeyed. End of chapter 10. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 11 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 4, Part 2, Urban Grandier by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The mode of torture employed at Laudon was a variety of the boot, and one of the most painful of all. Each of the victim's legs below the knee was placed between two boards. The two pairs were then laid one above the other and bound together firmly at the ends. Wedges were then driven in with a mallet between the two middle boards. Four such wedges constituted ordinary and eight extraordinary torture and this latter was seldom inflicted except on those condemned to death, as almost no one ever survived it, the sufferer's legs being crushed to a pulp before he left the torturer's bands. In this case, Monsieur de la Baudemont, on his own initiative, for it had never been done before, added two wedges to those of the extraordinary torture, so that instead of eight, ten were to be driven in. 
Nor was this all. The Commissioner Royal and the two Franciscans undertook to inflict the torture themselves. Laubardemont ordered Grandier to be bound in the usual manner, and then saw his legs placed between the boards. He then dismissed the executioner and his assistants, and directed the keeper of the instruments to bring the wedges, which he complained of as being too small. Unluckily, there were no larger ones in stock, and in spite of threats, the keeper persisted in saying he did not know where to procure others. M. de Laubardemont then asked how long it would take to make some, and was told two hours. Finding that too long to wait, he was obliged to put up with those, he had. Thereupon the torture began. Père Lactance, having exercised the instruments, drove in the first wedge, but could not draw a murmur from Grandier, who was reciting a prayer in a low voice. A second was driven home, and this time the victim, despite his resolution, could not avoid interrupting his devotions by two groans, at each of which Père Lactance struck harder, crying, Dicas! Dicas! Confess! Confess! A word which he repeated so often and so furiously, till all was over, that he was ever after popularly called Père Dicas. When the second wedge was in, de la Baudemont showed Grandier his manuscript against the celibacy of the priests, and asked if he acknowledged it to be in his own handwriting. Grandier answered in the affirmative. Asked what motive he had in writing it, he said it was an attempt to restore peace of mind to a poor girl whom he had loved, as was proved by the two lines written at the end. Si ton gentil esprit prenne bien cette science, tu mettras en repos ta bonne conscience. If thy sensitive mind imbibe this teaching, it will give ease to thy tender conscience. Upon this, M. de la Baudemont demanded the girl's name, but Grandier assured him it should never pass his lips, none knowing it but himself and God. Thereupon, M. de la Baudemont ordered Père Lactance to insert the third wedge. While it was being driven in by the monk's lusty arm, each blow being accompanied by the word Dicas, Grandier exclaimed, My God, they are killing me, and yet I am neither a sorcerer nor sacrilegious. At the fourth wedge, Grandier fainted, muttering, Oh, Père Lactance, is this charity? Although his victim was unconscious, Père Lactance continued to strike, so that having lost consciousness through pain, pain soon brought him back to life. De La Baudemont took advantage of this revival to make his turn at demanding a confession of his crimes. But Grandier said, I have committed no crimes, sir, only errors. Being a man, I have often gone astray. But I have confessed and done penance, and believe that my prayers for pardon have been heard. But if not, I trust that God will grant me pardon now, for the sake of my sufferings. At the fifth wedge, Grandier fainted once more but they restored him to consciousness by dashing cold water in his face, whereupon he moaned, turning to M. de la Baudemont. "'In pity, sir, put me to death at once. I am only a man, and I cannot answer for myself that if you continue to torture me, so I shall not give way to despair.' "'Then sign this, and the torture shall cease,' answered the Commissioner Royal, offering him a paper. "'My father,' said Urban, turning toward the Franciscan, can you assure me on your conscience that it is permissible for a man in order to escape suffering to confess a crime he has never committed no replied the monk for if he die with a lie on his lips he dies in mortal sin go on then said grandier for i have suffered so much in my body i desire to save my soul as pere lactance drove in the sixth wedge grandier fainted anew when he had been revived, Laubardemont called upon him to confess that a certain Elizabeth Blanchard had been his mistress, as well as the girl for whom he had written the tristesse against celibacy. But Grandier replied that not only had no improper relations ever existed between them, but that the day he had been confronted with her at his trial was the first time he had ever seen her. At the seventh wedge, Grandier's legs burst open, and the blood spurted into Père Lactance's face but he wiped it away with the sleeve of his gown. "'Oh, Lord, my God, have mercy on me! I die!' cried Grandier, and fainted for the fourth time. Père Lactance seized the opportunity to take a short rest and sat down. When Grandier had once more come to himself, he began to slowly utter a prayer so beautiful and so moving that the provost's lieutenant wrote it down, but Dallau Baudemont, noticing this, forbade him ever to show it to anyone. 
At the eighth wedge the bones gave way, and the marrow oozed out of the wounds, and it had become useless to drive in any more wedges, the legs being now as flat as the boards that can press them, and moreover Père Lactance was quite worn out. Grandier was unbound and laid upon the flagged floor, and while his eyes shone with fever and agony he prayed again a second prayer, a veritable martyr's prayer overflowing with faith and enthusiasm, but as he ended his strength failed, and he again became unconscious. The provost lieutenant forced a little wine between his lips, which brought him to. Then he made an act of contrition, renounced Satan and all his works once again, and commended his soul to God. Four men entered, his legs were freed from the boards, and the crushed parts were found to be a mere inert mass, only attached to the knees by the sinews. He was then carried to the council chamber and laid on a little straw before the fire. In a corner of the fireplace an Augustinian monk was seated. Urbain asked leave to confess to him, which de la Bonamont refused, holding out the paper he desired to have signed once more, at which Grandier said, "'If I would not sign to spare myself before, am I likely to give way now that only death remains?' "'True,' replied la Bonamont. "'But the mode of your death is in our hands. It rests with us to make it slow or quick, painless or agonizing. So take this paper?' and sign grandier pushed the paper gently away shaking his head in sign of refusal whereupon laubardemont left the room in a fury and ordered pere tranquille and claude to be admitted they being the confessors he had chosen for urbain when they came near to fulfil their office urbain recognized in them two of his torturers so he said that as it was only four days since he had confessed to pere grial and he did not believe he had committed any mortal sin since then he would not trouble them upon which they cried out at him as a heretic and infidel, but without any effect. At four o'clock the executioner's assistants came to fetch him. He was placed lying on a bier and carried out in that position. On the way he met the criminal lieutenant of Orléans, who once more exhorted him to confess his crimes openly, but Grandier replied, "'Alas, sir, I have avowed them all. I have kept nothing back.' "'Do you desire me to have masses said for you?' continued the lieutenant. "'I not only desire it, but I beg for it as a great favor," said Urbain. A lighted torch was then placed in his hand. As the procession started he pressed the torch to his lips. He looked on all whom he met with modest confidence, and begged those whom he knew to intercede with God for him. On the threshold of the door his sentence was read to him, and he was then placed in a small cart and driven to the church of St. Pierre in the marketplace. There he was awaited by M. de Laubardemont, who ordered him to alight. As he could not stand on his mangled limbs, he was pushed out, and fell first on his knees and then on his face. In this position he remained patiently, waiting to be lifted. He was carried to the top of the steps and laid down, while his sentence was read to him once more, and just as it was finished, his confessor, who had not been allowed to see him for four days, forced a way through the crowd and threw himself into Grandier's arms. At first tears choked Père Grial's voice, but at last he said, "'Remember, sir, that our Saviour Jesus Christ ascended to his Father through the agony of the cross. You are a wise man. Do not give way now and lose everything. I bring you your mother's blessing. She and I never cease to pray that God may have mercy on you and receive you in the paradise.' These words seemed to inspire Grandier with new strength. He lifted his head, which pain had bowed and raised his eyes to heaven, murmured a short prayer. Then, turned towards the worthy friar, he said, "'Be a son to my mother. Pray to God for me constantly. Ask all our good friars to pray for my soul. My one consolation is that I die innocent. I trust that God in his mercy may receive me into paradise.' "'Is there nothing else I can do for you?' asked Père Grial. "'Alas, my father!' replied Grandier. I am condemned to die a most cruel death. Ask the executioner if there is no way of shortening what I must undergo. I go at once, said the friar, and giving him absolution in articulo mortis, he went down the steps, and while Grandier was making his confession aloud, the good monk drew the executioner aside, and asked if there were no possibility of alleviating the death agony by means of a shirt dipped in brimstone. The executioner answered that, as the sentence expressly stated that Grandier was to be burnt alive, 
he could not employ an expedient so sure to be discovered as that, but that if the friar would give him thirty crowns he would undertake to strangle Grandier while he was kindling the pile. Pagriel gave him the money, and the executioner provided himself with a rope. The Franciscan then placed himself where he could speak to his penitent as he passed, and, as he embraced him for the last time, whispered to him what he had arranged with the executioner, whereupon Grandier turned toward the latter and said in a tone of deep gratitude, "'Thanks, my brother.' At that moment, the archers, having driven away Père Grial by order of M. de Laubardemont, by beating him with their halberts, the procession resumed its march to go through the same ceremony at the Ursuline Church, and from there to proceed to the square of St. Croix. On the way, Urbain met and recognized Moussant, who was accompanied by his wife, and turning towards him, said, "'I die your debtor, and if I have ever said a word that could offend you, I ask you to forgive me.' When the place of execution was reached, the provost lieutenant approached Grandier and asked his forgiveness. "'You have not offended me,' was the reply. "'You have only done what your duty obliged you to do.' The executioner then came forward and removed the black board of the cart, and ordered his assistants to carry Grandier to where the pile was prepared. As he was unable to stand, he was attached by the stake by an iron hoop passed round his body. At that moment a flock of pigeons seemed to fall from the sky, and fearless of the crowd, was so great that the archers could not succeed even by blows of their weapons in clearing away for the magistrates, began to fly around Grandier, while one, as white as the driven snow, alighted on the summit of the stake just above his head. Those who believed in possession exclaimed that they were only a band of devils come to seek their master, but there were many who muttered that devils were not wont to assume such a form and who persisted in believing that the doves had come in default of men to bear witness to Grandier's innocence. In trying next day to combat this impression, a monk asserted that he had seen a huge fly buzzing round Grandier's head, and as Beelzebub meant in Hebrew, as he said, the god of flies, it was quite evident that it was the demon himself who, taking upon him the form of one of his subjects, had come to carry off the magician's soul. When everything was prepared, the executioner passed the rope by which he meant to strangle him round Grandier's neck. Then the priests exercised the earth, air, and wood, and again demanded of their victim if he would not publicly confess his crimes. Urbain replied that he had nothing to say, but that he hoped through the martyr's death he was about to die to be that day with Christ in paradise. The clerk then read his sentence for him for the fourth time, and asked if he persisted in what he said under torture. "'Most certainly I do.' said Urbain, for it was the exact truth. Upon this, the clerk withdrew, first informing Grandier that if he had anything to say to the people, he was at liberty to speak. But this was just what the exorcists did not want. They knew Grandier's eloquence and courage and a firm, unshaken denial at the moment of death would be most prejudicial to their interests. As soon as, therefore, as Grandier opened his lips to speak, they dashed such a quantity of holy water in his face that it took away his breath. It was but for a moment, however, and he recovered himself and again endeavored to speak. A monk stooped down and stifled the words by kissing him on the lips. Grandier, guessing his intention, said loud enough for those next to the pile to hear, "'That was the kiss of Judas!' At these words the monks became so enraged that one of them struck Grandier three times in the face with a crucifix while he appeared to be giving it him to kiss. But by the blood that flowed from his nose and lips at the third blow, those standing near perceived the truth. All Grandier could do was to call out that he asked for a Salve Regina and an Ave Maria, which many began at once to repeat, whilst he, with clasped hands and eyes raised to heaven, commended himself to God and the Virgin. The exorcist then made one more effort to get him to confess publicly, but he exclaimed, "'My fathers!' I have said all I had to say. I hope in God and in his mercy. At this refusal, the anger of the exorcist surpassed all bounds, and Père Lactance, taking a twist of straw, dipped it in a bucket of pitch which was standing beside the pile, and lighting it at a torch, thrust it into his face, crying, Miserable wretch, will nothing force you to confess your crimes and renounce the devil? I do not belong to the devil said Grandier, pushing away the straw with his hands. "'I have renounced the devil. I now renounce him and all his works again, and I pray that God may have mercy on me.' At this, without waiting for the signal from the provost-lieutenant, 
Père Lactance poured the bucket of pitch on one corner of the pile of wood and set fire to it, upon which Grandier called the executioner to his aid, who, hastening up, tried in vain to strangle him while the flames spread apace. "'Ah, my brother!' said the sufferer. "'Is this the way you keep your promise?' "'It is not my fault,' answered the executioner. "'The monks have knotted the cord, so that the noose cannot slip.' "'Oh, Father Lactance, Father Lactance, have you no charity?' cried Grandier. The executioner by this time was forced by the increasing heat to jump down from the pile. Being indeed almost overcome, and seeing this, Grandier stretched forth a hand into the flames, and said, "'Père Lactance, God in heaven will judge between thee and me!' I summon thee to appear before him in thirty days. Grandier was then seen to make attempts to strangle himself, but either because it was impossible or because he felt it would be wrong to end his life by his own hands, he desisted and, clasping his hands, prayed aloud, Deus, meus, arte vigilo, miserere me. A capuchin, fearing that he would have time to say more, approached the pile from the side, which had not yet caught fire, and dashed the remainder of the holy water in his face. This caused such a smoke that Grandier was hidden for a moment from the eyes of the spectators. When it cleared away, it was seen that his clothes were now alight. His voice could still be heard from the midst of the flames raised in prayer. Then three times, each time in a weaker voice, he pronounced the name of Jesus, and giving one cry, his head fell forward on his breast. At that moment the pigeons, which had till then never ceased to circle round the stake, flew away and were lost in the clouds. Urbain Grandier had given up the ghost. End of chapter 11 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 12 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 4, Part 2, Urbain Grandier by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 This time it was not the man who was executed who was guilty, but the executioners. Consequently, we feel sure that our readers will be anxious to learn something of their fate. Père Lactance died in the most terrible agony on September 18, 1634, exactly a month from the date of Grandier's death. His brother monks considered that this was due to the vengeance of Satan— but others were not wanting who said, remembering the summons uttered by Grandier, that it was rather due to the justice of God. Several attendant circumstances seemed to favor the latter opinion. The author of the History of the Devils of Laozin gives an account of one of these circumstances for the authenticity of which he vouches, and from which we extract the following. Some days after the execution of Grandier, Père Lactance fell ill of the disease of which he died. Feeling that it was of supernatural origin, he determined to take a pilgrimage to Notre Dame des Andelliers de Saumur, where many miracles were wrought, and which was held in high estimation in the neighborhood. A place in the carriage of the Sieur de Canaille was offered him for the journey, for this gentleman, accompanied by a large party on pleasure bent, was just then setting out for his estate of Grand Fond, which lay in the same direction. The reason for the offer was that Canaille and his friends, having heard that the last words of Grandier had affected Père Lactance's mind, expected to find a great deal of amusement in exciting the terrors of their traveling companion. And in truth, for a day or two, the boon companions sharpened their wits at the expense of the worthy monk, when all at once, on a good road and without apparent cause, the carriage overturned. Although no one was hurt, the accident appeared so strange to the pleasure-seekers that it put an end to the jokes of even the boldest among them. Père Lactance himself appeared melancholy and preoccupied, and that evening at supper refused to eat, repeating over and over again, "'It was wrong of me to deny Grandier the confessor he asked for. God is punishing me. God is punishing me.' On the following morning the journey was resumed but the evident distress of mind under which Père Lactance labored had so damped the spirits of the party that all their gaiety had disappeared. Suddenly, just outside Finet, where the road was in excellent condition and no obstacle to their progress apparent, the carriage upset for the second time. Although again no one was hurt, the travelers felt that there was among them someone against whom God's anger was turned, and their suspicions pointing to Père Lactance, uh, they went on their way, leaving him behind, and feeling very uncomfortable at the thought that they had spent two or three days in his society. 
Père Lactance at last reached Notre Dame des Andilliers, but however numerous were the miracles there performed, the remission of the doom pronounced by the martyr on Père Lactance was not added to their number, and at a quarter past six on September 18th, exactly a month to the very minute after Grandier's death, Père Lactance expired in excruciating agony. Père Tranquille's turn came four years later. The malady which attacked him was so extraordinary that the physicians were quite at a loss and forced to declare their ignorance of any remedy. His shrieks and blasphemies were so distinctly heard in the streets that his brother Franciscans, fearing the effect they would have on his after-reputation, especially in the minds of those who had seen Grandier die with words of prayer on his lips, spread abroad the report that the devils whom he had expelled from the bodies of the nuns had entered into the body of the exorcist. He died shrieking, "'My God, how I suffer! Not all the devils and all the damned together endure what I endure!' His panegyrist, in whose book we find all the horrible details of his death, employed to much purpose to illustrate the advantages of belonging to the true faith, remarks, "'Truly big, generous heart must have been a hot hell for those fiends who entered his body to torment it.' The following epitaph, which was placed over his grave, was interpreted, according to the prepossessions of those who read it, either as a testimony to his sanctity or as a proof of his punishment. Here lies Père Tranquille of saint Remy, a humble Capuchin preacher, the demons no longer able to endure his fearlessly exercised power as an exorcist, and encouraged by sorcerers, tortured him to death on May 31st, 1638 but a death about which there could be no doubt as to the cause was that of the surgeon minori the same who had as the readers may recollect been the first to torture grandier one evening about ten o'clock he was returning from a visit to a patient who lived on the outskirts of the town accompanied by a colleague and preceded by his surgery attendant carrying a lantern when they reached the centre of the town in the rue grande pave which passes between the walls of the castle grounds and the gardens of the franciscan monastery Minori suddenly stopped, and staring fixedly at some object which was invisible to his companions, exclaimed with a start, "'Oh, there is Grandier!' "'Where? Where?' cried the others. He pointed in the direction toward which his eyes were turned, and beginning to tremble, violently asked, "'What do you want with me, Grandier? What do you want?' A moment later he added, "'Yes, yes, uh, I'm coming.' Immediately it seemed as if the vision vanished from before his eyes, but the effect remained. His brother surgeon and the servant brought him home, but neither candles nor the light of day could allay his fears. His disordered brain showed him Grandier ever standing at the foot of his bed. A whole week he continued, as was known all over the town, in this condition of abject terror. Then the spectre seemed to move from its place and gradually to draw nearer, for he kept repeating, "'He is coming!' he is coming and at length towards evening at about the same hour at which grandier expired surgeon minori drew his last breath we have still to tell of monsieur de laubardemont all we know is thus related in the letters of monsieur de patin on the ninth of the current month at nine o'clock in the evening a carriage was attacked by robbers on hearing the noise the townspeople ran to the spot drawn thither as much by curiosity as by humanity a few shots were exchanged and the robbers put to flight, with the exception of one man belonging to their band who was taken prisoner, and another who lay wounded on the paving stones. This latter died next day without having spoken and left no clue behind as to who he was. His identity was, however, at length made clear. He was the son of a high dignitary named de Laubardemont, who, in 1634, as royal commissioner, condemned Urbain Grandier, a poor priest of Laudon, to be burnt alive under the pretense that he had caused several nuns of Laudon to be possessed by devils. These nuns he had so tortured as to their behavior that many people foolishly believed them to be demoniacs. May we not regard the fate of his son as a chastisement inflicted by heaven on this unjust judge, an expiation exacted for the pitilessly cruel death inflicted on his victim, whose blood still cries unto the Lord from the ground? Naturally, the persecution of Urbain Grandier attracted the attention not only of journalists, but of poets. Among the many poems which were inspired by it, the following is one of the best. Urbain speaks. From hell came the tidings that, by horrible sanctions, I had made a pact with the devil to have power over women, though not one could be found to accuse me. 
in the trial which delivered me to torture and the stake the demon who accused me invented and suggested the crime and his testimony was the only proof against me the english in their rage burnt the maid alive like her i too fell a victim to revenge we were both accused falsely of the same crime in paris she is adored in london abhorred in laudon some hold me guilty of witchcraft some believe me innocent some halt between two minds like hercules i loved passionately like him i was consumed by fire but he by death became a god the injustice of my death was so well concealed that no one can judge whether the flames saved or destroyed me whether they blackened me for hell or purified me for heaven in vain did i suffer torments with unshaken resolution they said that i felt no pain being a sorcerer died unrepentant that the prayers i uttered were impious words that in kissing the image on the cross i spat in its face that casting my eyes to heaven i mocked the saints that when i seemed to call on god i invoked the devil others more charitable say in spite of their hatred of my crime that my death may be admired although my life was not blameless that my resignation showed that i died in hope and faith that to forgive to suffer without complaint or murmur is perfect love and that the soul is purified from the sins of life by a death like mine end of chapter 12 recording by john van stan savannah georgia end of celebrated crimes volume 4 part 2 Urban Grandier by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by George Burnham Ives.